Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode four. Right, Dave? Episode four. Yes. We got, uh, we're on a roll here. So this is uh, hey John. John Furrier with Dave Vellante, host of the Cube. This is our podcast where we go out and talk about the weekly things that are happening in our world, what we're looking at, and what we're analyzing. And then we're you know top news. You know, AI stuff's happening, Dave. A lot of stuff's going on. Of course, we do our rant section, which is my favorite. Uh, lots of rant about this week. Uh, but still, tons of blowback from Silicon Valley Bank uh, debacle. Um, a lot of questions around the banking industry, crisis around that, liquidity crisis, Wall Street impact. It's a very weird time, Dave. This is, uh, it's been an interesting week. It's, I can't believe it's been a week since we did our podcast. We, we soft-pedaled the Silicon Valley Bank story on Thursday uh, before the big run on the bank. But the word, a lot of stuff coming out, Dave, on the SPB, more and more data coming out. You know, people are talking about the run on the bank. Was that pushed by anyone? Was there an agenda? Um, and then First Republic, which looks very safe, bank, is also under threat. Um, and they're under siege. And then they just got bailed out, if you want to say the word. We'll get into what the semantics mean around bailout. Is that First Republic just got $30 billion dollars from their friendly other banks and their little network. So yeah. banks came together, keeping it in the family, Dave. This is this is a very mafiosa deal. Banks taking care of banks. They didn't want the government in there. So, you know, Silicon Valley Bank caused a string of of of, of, of events. And, you know, we called it on the last pod that's going to have an impact. So the system, the banking system is this operating system. They all kind of work together. And then, then I don't think they want the government involved. So I think the First Republic could be a signal of the banks all getting together in their karitsu and saying, hey, stay away. We get out of our underwear, government. We don't want you involved. Because if First Republic goes sideways on liquidity, guess what? In comes the FDIC. Well, you know, this weekend, you and I were chatting. I got a text from one of our you know, colleagues saying, First Republic's next. And then at the same time, we saw what was floating around the the message that First Republic was sending, you know, to its depositors, of which we know many. I actually am one, and so you saw that. That was like, uh oh, they're going to cause another bank run. So that was really interesting that the likes of J.P. Morgan and others are stepping in and saying, hey, "Government, we got this." And so I kind of like the move. I don't think that's a bailout, by the way. It's because well, the government, government's not involved. I think Silicon Valley Bank, we could talk about that. But I, I talked to somebody last night. One of our customers told me they had all their money in SVB and they were able to get out enough to meet payroll. They were really sweating it. I know you've heard this, this story over and over. Yeah, no, it's, it's everyone's happy. The depositors got taken care of and they're going to be guaranteed all their cash. So that's a good thing. Um, but you know, first- John... SVB, you saw that story in the journal. He went to Goldman for advice in February, which which culminated in that attempt to do a private placement, right? They were going to do a private placement to raise enough capital to shore up the position because Moody's was going to do a downgrade and they couldn't pull off the, the private placement. So they decided to do a public offering and it, and it all came out in that announcement that you know, $2 billion loss and they were going to do a stock sale and everybody freaked out and we know the story from there. But you know, Goldman is supposed to be the platinum standard for advice, and that, that advice was fatal. Yeah, as yeah, that happened last week. I know we were. It's been a lot. I can't believe it's been a week. It's been, it's been crazy. I, I you and I debated about the First Republic. I didn't think they were going to have any problems at all. Different kind of bank, different makeup, but the liquidity crisis is happening around. Credit Suisse had some issues, um, and the fact of the matter is, is that. This is a really a debate. Should the government really be involved or not? And I think the banks are taking care of themselves because they have to. It's a system, right? If something goes down in the system, the system kind of reacts to it. But the money's moving around. They're all in cahoots. They're all kind of related, even though they have different agendas and firms. Um, they have to kind of stay. Otherwise, the government will be in there. And and this whole idea of the run on the bank and the, the commentary from, from the top quote firms like the New York Times – for instance, what's his name over there? Uh, Andrew Sorkin was like, this is a bailout. He got his butt handed to him. People were in his underwear saying it's not a bailout. And Dave, and I saw you commented on his Twitter feed and said, here's the definition of the bailout. So, 
Yeah, the word bailouts is an interesting discussion. It's a fucking bailout. I mean, I don't know why people are going after him. Kara Swishers. What's wrong with you people in Silicon Valley? Kara Swishers on, on the TV going, no, it's not a bailout. It's not a bailout. Everybody's jumping on Sorkin. It's a by definition, it's a it's bailout. Not, it's Sorry, not a, I'm getting it, getting Dave, into a rant. Dave, it's not a bailout. Okay, let's <laughs> it, get into it. By let's definition, get in, okay. it's a it's a bailout. What the, you guys are in some kind of did, like did you use chat GPT? Here. Did you use chat GPT for that definition? No, what's a bailout? Not, not a bailout is when the when the government provides financial support to a failing institution. Bailout. That was a bailout. You guys are full, full of crap out there. <laughs> actually, it was, it was the guy on the East Coast actually who said that, Dave. So, 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 <laughs> is it a bailout when the equity holders go belly up? Well, uh, so let's mean? go. Let's go back and do a little history lesson. Two thousand and eight. The yeah. government bailed out the big banks, too big to fail. Yes. Bear Stearns got bought by J.P. Morgan. Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11. But Goldman Sachs, all the other banks, J.P. Morgan, all got their equity back, and the government bailed them out. Agreed? Yes. Agreed. Agreed. So they, they secured the cash, and everyone kept their equity. So that's a bailout. Yeah. That they bailed out the players yeah, well, how's directly. How's this not a bailout? How's this not a bailout? The equity holders lose all their cash. All they did was guarantee the deposits. No, but how's this not a bailout? What does that have to do with the definition uh, of, of a bailout? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let me let me let me let me let me finish. It's like finish. making stuff out up there. Go ahead. Sorry. What do you mean making stuff out here? It's just well, facts, I, I, it's a def, it's by definition. Hey. It's really simple. When the okay. government steps in to save an institution and provides financial support, it's by definition. A bailout. Andrew Ross Sorkin was right. Sorry, okay. you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Let's let's go back to the semantics. Now, 2020, the airlines. Remember with COVID? The government yeah, bailed out the vaguely, airlines. Vaguely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they were losing money, and they gave trillions to the to uh, billions to the to the airlines. All kept their equity. And in this in this scenario, they they lost all their equity. All they did, they, and they had the liquidity, and they just, they couldn't get it out in time for the run. So all they did was prevent the run on the bank. They ended up going under because of other reasons, but but the, the money is there, right? They still even got two point two billion left in in holdings. So, so how's it, that not a bailout? I, I don't understand. I mean, if they didn't, if the government didn't step in, what would have happened? Well, I mean, this is this this is my point about the semantics. Wait, wait, answer my the, question: If the government didn't step in, what would have happened to the, all the startups and all the VCs? We don't know. Oh, what do you think would have happened, John? Well, they probably would have lost all their cash. Yes, and that's yeah. so they got bailed out. By the government backstopping them, it's yeah, it's a different yeah. type of bailout. And by the way, okay. it was Dave, absolutely the right thing to do. Dave, I just want to, I just want, I'm just trying to get into the semantics of the bailout for people to just throw their hands up. Oh, that's a bailout. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, let's just get into what we're talking about here. The fact is, Silicon Valley Bank got saved by the FDIC for the deposits that were there. The bank fucked up on the liquidity problem. That's their fault, self-inflicted. We covered that last week. But the bailout of the institution didn't happen. Unlike the banks in 2008 and the airlines in 2020 they were bailed out and the equity holders got better that's a bailout to me that's consistent with here if so if the if the bailout happened here svb would have definitely had the equity holders preserved and come out of it better off just like the banks and just like the airlines. So the okay. question of bailout is a semantic one. Okay, you can pull it's the definition. You can you can get it's, a definition off the web not, and hey dictionary. Not hey Dave, go to dictionary.com. They know what they're talking about. It's not semantics. This was okay. a bailout of startups and VCs. It wasn't a bailout of the bank. They backstopped the bank, but they bailed out the depositors who were not insured over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the VCs who were who had funded all oh. those. I'm, I'm, I'm just all I'm saying is relative to the debate of bailout versus non bailout. It's it's semantics. If you're going to look at the history of the banks and the airlines, that it's to me semantics. is the standard. That's the it's standard. Silicon of Silicon Valley bullshit. This is more of your Silicon Valley bullshit. It's like it's not semantics. A bailout is when a, when a government steps in, provides some, some financial support to a failing institution. Those failing institutions were startups. Now I'm not saying the VCs were failing, but they would have been hurt badly. But they did get bailed out. Well, they, that, Dave, I'm really glad you got your dictionary next to your bed. So I'm really well, glad we, right, we covered well, that. Well, what, do you, what do you use? You just make up your own words, like Donald. I mean, Donald Trump is that like our, our alternative facts, alternative <laughs> definition? Okay, great. All right, so 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 you're for bailout. So a bailout uh, is only if it's an airline or a bank was going to go under. I mean, what? Come on, a bailout's a bailout, John. All right, so. So, so Federal Republic, you got money in there. Did you get it out, Dave? 
Oh no, I I didn't take it out. I stuck with it. I'm I'm I, I was confident that uh, that that was going to be good. I mean, so so do you think the bank God, should be regulated in. by the government? Yes, the banks absolutely should be regulated by the government. The, the government did great things after the 2008 crisis by forcing the banks to have these stress tests. Now, I've said before that I think that the regulators failed here because they failed to to do a stress test on rising interest rates. They just ignored that. They made the assumption that interest rates were going to stay low. Oops. Well, but now they're going to, I think, revisit that. I think the other question is, are they going to regulate the smaller banks? And that could be an issue because it's going to increase, you know, trickle down to the consumers. So that's a trickier one. But large banks absolutely have to be regulated by the government. So what no do you question. think about the $30 billion rescue of a First Republic bank? I think the banks point, taking care of I love of the your banks. point on that. I keep it in the family. Banks, we're going we're gonna to take care of this. And especially Jamie Dimon. You know, Jamie Dimon, he said he didn't need the bailout from the government in 2008. The government forced him to take it. He was one of the few. But He, he said he never should have bought Bear Stearns either. I mean, they forced him to buy it. They said, you're going to buy Bear Stearns. And so, you know, credit to him for saying, hey, we don't need the government. We're going to step in. We can keep it in the family. I think too much regulation is bad. I, I would agree with that. But it, it, it's got to be a balance. They're absolutely, the government has to regulate the financial institutions. The, to me, the big question now is, should they say, hey, all deposits are going to be backstopped if you invest in treasuries or something like that? I, I mean, I, that's- So should me the is, government also regulate the big tech companies? No, no. Government sucks at regulating big tech. It, it's just a completely different situation of big tech. You know, if Amazon, if, you know, if if- if Microsoft fails to see the internet and misses the boat, or IBM, you know, fails to to downsize and and and, and capitalize on the PC trend because they're trying to hold on to their monopoly and they fail, you know, so what? I mean, I think it's different than the banking system. And this is where I love what you know JP Morgan and others are doing because they're saying, hey, this is really important that we take care of our own because the banking system is. Well, it's the banking system. It's the financial system. It affects so many people. Big tech, leave big tech alone unless they're breaking the law. If they're breaking the law, they should be punished. Big tech kind of affects people too. It's, it's a good debate, but I definitely not force, not, I'm not for any government regulation personally. So that's my, my feeling. We'll see. But the banking thing is unique. And I think this is a moment in time where the velocity of digital the run on the bank is just an adult version of what happened at GameStop. That that uh, bunch of Reddit Reddit threads got together and put a run on the hedge fund. So this new dynamic of velocity, Dave, and crowd sourcing, collective intelligence, and movement is interesting. This is you know, something to deal with now. There is a there is a school of thought, John, that says you know let the banks fail. There was a school of thought that said that in two thousand eight. I don't know. I'm a, I'm not there because I think we could probably still be in a depression if that happened. I mean, that's a lot of pain for people. I do. I am concerned about the debt levels because the government does doesn't have you know the Fed doesn't have many knobs to turn anymore. But I think you know uh, running the bank, people losing losing their life savings. That's uh, I'm not for that. Yeah, I mean, I do. I know, know people. I know people Sean, who worked worked at Silicon Valley Bank who had their entire life. Uh, upended and lost everything and they're just employees they weren't the ceos taking out the big because you know, ceos and the some of the top management took out millions before the crash but there are people who like have equity in that bank and yeah, they're well, they're different. broke that's different the, there's the no bailout market, for them the stock market has inherent risks sticking, no your money in the, sticking your money in the bank shouldn't have the same risk as the stock market if you invest in svb you know, you got to do your I mean, homework. I mean, you know? SVB, I mean, SVB wasn't really a, bank, a consumer bank, Dave. It was really more for startups and venture funds. Their deposits were, it wasn't an FDIC-like bank. It wasn't like they had grandma in there. It was like big money. Kind of like First Republic was for wealth and, and big funds. Right. Silicon Valley Bank has, was the same on the other side. So their makeup yeah, but, was a little bit different bank. It wasn't a consumer bank. Yeah, but anybody could invest in it, is all I'm saying. I mean, the retail investor could invest in SVB or First Republic. They could buy the stock. And if yeah. they lost their money, I mean, it's down, you know, that's, yeah. First Republic's down, I don't know, 70% this month. So, hey, retail investors got hurt. I'm not saying they should get bailed out. I do think if you're going to bail out, if the, if the banks are too big to fail, you're going to bail out the big banks that you should backstop SVB and protect all these startups. And, you know, the residual effect is VCs. I don't, I don't have as much compassion for the for the, for the the VCs because they'll figure it out. But the, but the startups, 
I yeah. have a lot of. And the, how about the employees who work at Silicon Valley yeah, Bank? They're not backed out. They know they're not bailed out. They lost everything. The equity yeah. in the firm. So they have, you know, it's a, you know, SVB is a holding company. SVB Financial, the trading is a company, is a holding company. Silicon Valley Bank had multiple kind of divisions. They had a capital division, they had an investment division, and they had a bank. The yep. bank was the bank for startups. Those people who work there are not bailed out. They're lost everything. So what are you saying? They should have bailed out the bank. What I'm saying is, is that by treatment of the 08 and 2020, the it should should have been a, it should be a real bailout. That's my semantic point was a bailout by the definition of the government bailing out the banks that were too big to fail, they said, and the airlines too big to fail. I think this Silicon Valley Bank was one of those situations where by the unique makeup of the customer base, they should have bailed out the bank. That's they a different have. argument. That's a different argument you're making. Well, and I, let's well that's what I'm saying. Well, that's, so this, this you're is saying why the this... scope of the bailout should have been widened. If you're saying that. Yeah, and this is why everyone was was dancing around the semantics of the word bailout and reacting kind of like the way you did. They know you're talking about out there. I mean, Silicon applying that we're out, out to lunch. When reality is the, my, the semantic word of bailout, you're you're right. And you, it saves the company, and they kind of saved the depositors, but they didn't save the company. The company went under. That's that's not a Are you bailout. Saying they should have. Are they say you saying. I think well, I think isn't... I think with well, the CEO who sold the they... shares and those assholes, they should get they should be looked at. But I think the people who worked at Silicon Valley Bank, it was kind of a cog in the wheel in its unique way, should have been bailed out uh, fully, uh, equity holders included, um, and they should have been punished for the mis the malpractice of the not hedging properly and hand taking care of that the interest rate shift. I mean, everybody saw it coming. That's the problem. Was again, there's other consequences. You get the right hand, you know, one side saying, hey, that's the government's problem. The government saying, no, it's the bank's problem. So I'm just saying that everyone's arguing about this bailout term. I'm just saying semantics matter. So my position is they should, to go all the way in the bailout, they should say the equity yeah. holders should. should okay, so it. you admit it was a bailout. Words matter too. So of course. Now I think we finally have some common ground here that the bailout was for the startups and the depositors. And obviously the VCs that were backing them, you're arguing that the bailout should have had a wider scope and included yeah. the bank itself. That's an interesting. I, I, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. And that's I mean, the, the, the the Wall Street side of it. It's like they look at the trading stock, which went to zero. It's, it's halted because it's under receivership in the bank. So, okay, they go chapter 11. That makes sense. Just like um, at 2008, the other bank in Washington uh, thing that went down. So cool. But that there's no bailout for that. But the equity holders at the bank, the employees, I think they should have been bailed out. That's that's unfortunate, and that and the run in the bank, whether it was caused by VCs or um, bad actors, nobody can prove that. And so that debate is going on as well. So the bailout caught my attention because I saw your comment to Sorkin. I saw his tweet as well, and I saw this. The, a lot of people saying, "No, no, it's not a real real bailout." And then I said, "Well, what does that even mean?" So, and then looking at it, you look at the 2008 and 2020 airlines in particular in 2020 the pandemic basically crushed the airline business it's but a did different the, if did a the different hotels did the hotels get question. bailed out but wait but, it's a different type of question but a uh, 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 different type of bailout no question but are you saying that you said the equity holders should have been bailed out? so if i'm a retail investor in svb and the stock drops or, or first republic gets crushed you're saying how how would you bail out the the so goldman investors? goldman sachs got bailed out in the crisis in 2008 no one got fired. The, the company didn't go out of business. Um, Morgan Stanley didn't go out of business. Yeah, but what do you mean? Like the Morgan Stanley holders? actually became a bank, actually. What do you mean that. the equity holders? What do you mean by the equity? Oh, the owners, the stock owners, the people who own it, people who work. How, with how do you bail out stock owners? You're going to just, you mean bail out in the sense that you keep the institution going. So it's still a public yeah. company. Yes. Even though you lost, you're not saying they, they should have backstopped their loss, right? They're going to lose money. Yeah, just keep the company around. They should have bailed the company out with more on the equity side. But right now, the the Biden position and Lee Yellen's position on the last the Sunday news was, we're not going to bail out the equity holders. That's just the depositors. That's it. And that's what they have they, used taxpayer money to do that. In your opinion? Yeah, I, I'm just pointing out the semantics of it. You oh, know. oh no, that's a key question. I, I'm not that's sure. That's why. That's yeah, why. I mean, the, that's why the Biden administration is saying no, 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 because. Should they have used taxpayer money like they did in 2008? That was taxpayer money. You know, I don't really know. I'm not, I don't have the pay grade that, to understand that level. But the commentary that I'm seeing, in my, and for me, it's like, yeah, what? how much would that have been? It's not trillions. I mean, 08 was trillions, right? So that was different. Um, and then there's different kind of levels of, well, of scenarios. Um, it's not trillions I a, here. I got a text this morning 
from one of my Bond guys who sent me a chart from Mohammed El Arian. He's on a rant. And it shows uh, the, 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 the discount window for the Federal Reserve primary credit lending. In the recession, it was like $100 billion. In the pandemic, it was like $50 billion. And then now it's like $150 billion. So I was like, what's a discount window? Discount window functions as a safety valve in relieving pressures in reserve markets. Extensions of credit can help alleviate liquidity strains at a depository institution in the, breaking, in, in the banking system as a whole. This is setting new records in terms of the discount window. So, but back to the question of should it be taxpayer money that to me is a tougher one, John. It's a tough um, pill to swallow. I, I'm with you on that. I don't really know how I feel about it. That's why I was getting into the whole semantic conversation of what the hell does a bailout mean? Because that you know the definition that you posted is you know makes sense, but there's a lot of nuanced points here. For instance, there are a lot of regional banks are getting killed. First Republic just announced that they're going to uh, just 15 minutes ago they're going to suspend their dividend. Stocks plummeted. You got. First Republic, Pac West Bank Corp, uh, Zion's Fifth Third Bank Corp, and Key Corp. <laughs> I got a capital call due to First Republic. I'm like, okay, I think I'll wait a couple of days. Yes. <laughs> 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 uh, that those that venture funds, you know, these LPs, um, it's gonna be very interesting. Again, I don't know how I feel about it. I guess I'm not an expert. I'm not going to claim to be. A, uh, I ne never said I was a vax expert when the anti-vaxing thing was going around. I'm not a bank expert, but I know how banks work. But to me, the banks are taking care of themselves. That's obvious. And that's the question: Is that a system that's worth that's working? Not really. Not looking good right now. So, so the regulation question is is the legit one. And then, you know, taxpayer benefit, if there's, if the cost involved, it's going to be interesting to see. But there's definitely going to be reverb. There's going to be a real impact for Silicon Valley uh, for a long time to come. I think this is going to cement what I was calling a depression last podcast uh, when we when we talked about this. I said on the podcast, I said, this is going to have, you know, a real impact. And I was, I remember, remember when I talked about, I traded my position around on this rec recession. I think it's a lot worse. It looks a lot more like a depression than it does a, you know, recession with a soft landing. So, so we, so I so, kind of disagree with you, but let's talk about that. So you were saying this is worse than dot than, than dot com. I think you were saying, yeah. uh, and I was like, ah, I didn't see it that way. Um, you still believe that? Uh, I, I felt like when the banks, you know, when the government, you know, shored up the depositors, I said, okay, there it is. I was right. John was wrong. But I will tell you. I think there's ripple effects that are going to come here that we don't know about yet. And so you could be right. Uh, well, we don't, we don't, we don't know. I mean, right. yeah, there's uh, there's a hard landing, there's a soft landing, and then there's no landing at all where the economy can outpace inflation. Okay. So I'm just not seeing yeah. the economy outpacing inflation right now. And the Fed's job to do a soft landing, as you know, Dave, because you've watched this closely is to pull back inflation. Okay. To, land softly and guess uh guess what that inflation interest rates look what happened with the banks so is is this a tell sign is this a signal that there this this is not a soft landing well and the fed says that they're not worried about the debt they said they said a couple of years ago they weren't worried about inflation that inflation was transitory so i don't trust anything the, these guys the economists say they just don't know and they can't you know, people talk about black swans. Is this another black swan? You know, there are blacks. It's like the black swans is like, it's like the weather <laughs> It's all around us. So I don't know, John, I think there are some unpredictable ripple effects of this. And so I hope you're wrong, but you may end up being right. What do you think? Depression or recession? I think this is going to be a long tech. I do think in the sense, you're right in the sense that the 2000 post.com Post 9-11, really, you remember, you know, from 01 to like 04, 05, you know, even the, you know, through the Google, you know, IPO, that was kind of the catalyst to the slow comeback. I think it's going to be a very long kind of tech sideways. I think stock prices are going to be sideways for a long, long time, um, maybe two or three years. Uh, I could see that happening, but I still... I'm a long-term optimist for tech. Yeah. I think innovation is going to productivity is still going to going to you know pound through yeah. it, but it could take a long time. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, depression is a, a hard word. I mean, it's just to grapple with that concept. The last real depression was 29 to 39. We've never had a 10-year 
run of multiple town turns. So, I mean, I just don't see that. And, you know, our next segment on around the AI hype really points to that. Let's get into that, get into that because, you know, no landing at all assumes that the economy is going to grow faster than inflation. So are we set up for, you know, that with the tech scene, Dave? I mean, this is the next question. You know, the AI (laughs) hype is brooming. Inflation is to me the one thing that that scares me. You got to stamp tamp down inflation, and the only tool they have to do that is is rising rates. You 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 increase rates, you hurt you hurt tech because tech's all about growth. Uh, so, but you know we've lived through you know long periods of high interest rates. You and I both, and you know I mean tech was a different business back then. I I, I think John, I do think. Uh, large language models, GPD foundation models, whatever you want to call them, is this new wave. And I think I feel like we're jumping S curves. It takes a while, as you know, to jump S S curves because the beginning of the S curve isn't big enough to offset the existing stuff. So that's why I think it could be a a couple of years before we see another kind of rocket ship in tech. Well, I I think the AI thing will open up an interesting conversation around, will this be that jump. We're going to get into the um, AI thing, Dave, but this economy with inflation is, is is no hard landing. But again, last podcast and up multiple podcasts, we kind of brought up the crypto angle, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, alternative to the banking system is if the banks are crashing and they're not getting the job done in their system and the government won't regulate them, guess who fills the void? An opportunity for crypto. And I've always said crypto should replace the banking system. The plumbing's getting there. Then it kind of went sideways. So the question is, can crypto fill the void for the banking? And is that going to be a path? And crypto's not having a, a great time these days too. And as I said, I think crypto is kind of fading in, in, in hype, obviously, and success. And AI is booming. So, you know, is this an opportunity for the for the cryptos? Is it the second wind can they take it as well? Can they? Can yes. They, can they suck Absolutely. it up? Absolutely. Look, gold is bouncing around at an all-time high, and Bitcoin's rallied almost forty percent since this SVB news. I say, get unbanked. The is the message. You know, look, you can spread your assets around. You should, I guess, in two hundred fifty thousand dollar increments across a bunch of banks. Go for it. But you got to put some crypto in the mix. I, I'm still a believer. I believe in the premise. I've never, I've never sold all my crypto. I, I keep adding more. It's, I'm, you know, take the kids are going to have it. I hope. I, yeah, I think I, Bitcoin at some point is going to go to a hundred thousand. I do. I think crypto is has an opportunity here, and and it must fill the void. It has to step up. I think um, Coinbase is of the world, and the blockchain aspect of it is pretty compelling, and they should they should get on board. And they just got to get all that crap out of the system, all the stable coins that were um, shit coins. They got to get them all cleaned out. They got to clean out the tokens. That whole token fraud business has got to be taken care of. So I think there's a little bit of cleanup to do on crypto, Dave. But you know, the basis of Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think, are the foundation are foundational elements and are, are going to be around for a long, long you time. You did some great work, and I, you know, as I was with you, and, and when we were doing our crypto tour, and we we paid attention to it you know, in more detail as a catalyst, but we met some of the smartest people doing some really interesting, they were mission driven, great developers. Yeah. A lot of scams, you know, a lot of hype. It's always the way, but, but, but the fundamental idea and the innovation model around, around blockchain and, you know, crypto as a potential funding mechanism and a, and a game theory and, you know, game theory meets cryptography. I, I, those, to me, those fundamentals are still there cutting out waste, cutting out the middlemen. As I said before, I think I think foundation models like GPT and crypto are going to come together. I think a lot of that automation and 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 cutting out the waste, I, I think those themes are are, are are parallel. Yeah, I do. I think it's a great opportunity. And you're exactly right. That fraud aspect of it was really a hype. And we're gonna, I think we're going to see that with AI too, Dave. I mean, I'm, I think the movie is now all the new promise of new technology gets out there and then gets dirty quick and then gets cleaned up and hopefully reset. I think crypto will have a reset in the sense of getting back on the trajectory of being, you know, a global financial and, you know, business and economic engine that it is. And, you know, and it's decentralized and it's immutable. Those 
characteristics if they can get the developer action going back on with say ethereum and get real good developer d apps going again um that's going to be critical so we'll we'll keep watching that but again ai ai we're seeing that same movie all the alpha geeks go there some coolness pops up and then it will get dirty and ugly and i think that's the question i just posted on twitter to Om Malik, who who shared um, Tarek Krim, who's a, a, a friend of ours from the Web 2.0 days, and uh, he's in France, and he posted um, the coverage of the flash insurrection that kind of happened uh, in France because they raise taxes every time they raise taxes in France. They protest, everyone strikes, they burn, and, and they throw stuff on the streets. And they have a protest, basically. They call it the insurrection. But the photos were manipulated with the new technology and the AI tech. And this is uh, this is misinformation and it's at its best. It looks so compelling, it looks like a war zone. So I asked the question, what will be the big thing that will cause us to slow down with AI? Will there be an event of some important consequence that makes us pause is the remember Twitter when the plane landed on the Hudson river. Oh, I get how Twitter works. People talk really fast to each other. Is there going to be a moment like that in AI where people go, Whoa, slow down. Is it a death? Is it fraud? Is it an election tampering? Is it some sort of th- uh, bad information that turns into a, into a crisis or math mass problem? This is going to be interesting because we're in a moment of great exploration with AI and, 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 and with chat GPT launching for this week, it's going beyond the large language model to multimodal. You got images, you got video and text, audio, and then just you know AI imager, uh, mid journey V five stunning results, photorealistic images and five fingered hands. You know, <laughs> it's like it's really compelling, creepy, it's almost too perfect, Dave. And well, so, so you're gonna have a lot of. You know, content mills popping up with the chat GPT. You know, you're going to have a lot of fake images. Um, it's going to be amazing to see how this exploration creatively either train wrecks somewhere or or advances. What do you, you think? You, you're going to you're seeing that you're going to see the digital twinning of everything. Um, and then, you know, just the whole last five years or whatever, fake news. We're, we're going to enter a new era of faking people out. You know, you talked about deep fakes, John. I remember, gosh, it was almost 10 years ago you were talking about deep fakes and kind of yeah. predicting how that was going to affect the world. And I mean, it, 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 I think I think we're going to have to use AI to detect, you know, AI. You see that now with ChatGPT, right? Uh, AI yeah. can detect if there was, you know, ChatGPT signature on there. I think, you know, you've been talking about GPT-4. This is a... I did a breaking analysis on this today. It's a two-edged sword, uh, particularly for automation platforms. You, you know, like a company like UiPath crushed its earnings. Stock was up like 17%, um, you know, after the, the news. And then you got Microsoft Power Automate, which is their RPA, very well positioned and foundation models coming in. And it's going to suck up a lot of these low-end RPA use cases and cannibalize some of the some of the you know traditional RPA. That's a very narrow example of the disruption. Um, yeah. And but but the other thing is, what's the response from AWS and, and Google, who are the other big you know guys in AI? And I would also say, you know, China. I felt like was leading in AI, and now I feel like the U.S. is back in the game. I mean, not that U.S. was ever out, but it's like U.S. you know is holding serve here. You know, Dave, this is like interesting. You know, the chat GPT-4 you mentioned, it's going to get pretty weird quick, I think. It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I just, it's impressive. It's just so damn cool. Like, it's great that large language models will get more reasoning to it. I saw a developer write video games from our days, Asteroids, Space Invaders, you know, Pong, (laughs) Breakout, literally writing the code in real time for video games. So, you know, low code, no code to, you know, in, integrating it in to, to products. I mean, Microsoft announced, obviously, because their relationship with open AI, it's definitely Microsoft one and, and Amazon zero right now in terms of AI <laughs> relative to the hype factor for sure. That's- but their, but their open AI thing is just, just early innings, but actually Microsoft is behind in my opinion, compared to Google and, and Amazon on AI 
um, if you look at the code that they've been writing. The open AI was a relationship that Microsoft put together, and we'll get into them laying off their ethics team in a bit. But you know, Microsoft's chat GPT uh, on Bing is compelling. They're integrating it into uh, all their apps, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, and Teams. So you're going to have this, this AI enabled thing called Copilot, right? Which is, you know, the, the. Yeah. Well, so they, they might've been behind in tech. I would kind of agree, but they, they it's like they leaped ahead in the business model now, John. I mean, that's, yeah. they, they're so well positioned with Azure. And like you said, their office suite and now chat GPT. I mean, go ahead. My, my I mean, it's a huge jump. I mean, first of all, it's a big jump. So the one nothing lead, in my opinion, is huge because the jump was so massive. Just think about the logic of this, you know, we love AWS. We're a customer with the best tools compared to Azure for us. And a lot of companies fall into that same category, that Amazon Web Services is by far a better cloud than Azure. Okay. Over the years, Azure has been really making ground up on the cloud. Now their cloud's getting better. They've been really working hard over the past, say, five years and three years in particular, made great strides on CapEx. It's well documented. fitzy has got all the numbers over at his blog on um, Platformomics. This move is so good for Microsoft because it gets people like me and other AWS loyal customers to thinking I'm going to get an Azure server spun up because just to get access to the API. And so this is huge. This is just, this is a subtle but important chess move that has benefits downstream for Azure, not only for the Amazon, I mean, Microsoft's brand, Bing has got major 100 million concurrent active users. Bing is up. It's going to make their products more relevant and sexier and cooler and better, right? Uh, the suite of Office, the old Office now in the cloud is cloud, their cloud SaaS apps now. Okay. Not only do they kick ass there, they're going to get some cloud action, customers, developers. Absolutely. You know, so John, this is huge I, impact, huge after, impact. Right after SuperCloud, we did a breaking analysis. You saw, saw Gene and I on uh, ChatGPT, and the premise was, at least I put forth, they're not going to have first mover advantage. You didn't necessarily agree with that. I, I'm rethinking it because they've not, they're getting so much early data to, to fine tune and train their models, learn what not to do the whole, yeah. you know, ethics thing. We're going to talk about that, but, but they're just building up a first mover advantage. So I, I'm going to have to. Well, I mean, the, this is what's great about this is why I love what we do. And I wish I was 25 again. And uh, within this market is all the new text killer. Great. We've said this on the cube many times, and and I believe it to be true, and I think it's playing out to be true. The competitive advantage, the old school business school logic of how people compete for their value is to changing. You got open source is no longer open source kills the whole proprietary software game, so that's gone. So hello, open source. You have scale with the cloud. So my thesis is, and my premise has always been, the competitive advantage lock in is scale. Yeah. Uh, and then the the differentiation or uh, economies of scale come from things like you just mentioned, the learnings. So how fast can Microsoft learn with open AI over, say, AWS, who's certainly going to get into this game? Oh, yeah. Does that trajectory give them better advantage on the scale, on the learnings, on the data? And of course, as you know, in the cloud, cloud players see all the workloads. So they understand how to optimize. So there's a new kind of a first mover vibe where on paper, you'd scratch your head and go, I think 150 million, I could replicate that. Well, you can on paper, like I've always said about Reddit, right? I mean, Reddit's open source software, but no, you can't replicate Reddit because it's got scale and it's hard to, hard to kind, of, kind of a bad example, but you get the No, idea. it's a good example. They've built a moat with that scale and that community is yeah. a moat. And so that to me is why I think open AI. Now, the only thing that could change the game on open AI is if they make a bad bet. And this is what I was talking with John Truro with Madrona Venture Partners on the Cube a couple of weeks ago. If there's more foundational models coming in and more multimodal AI, you know, tooling and platforms, then the question is, do you go monolithic or you integrate? So if you're open AI, you got to say to yourself that we're not going to be the only language model in town, large language model in town. So the question is, if they make a strategic bet and go the wrong way, meaning you're saying you're saying it could be a better product that comes or, out, or or is there or if they take an arrogant position and say I'm going to well, there's only one lag, large language model to rule the world, that's basically betting on one centralized set of services. Yeah. 
Other people are saying, no, it's going to be open and very democratized, where integration and data fabric and semantic data layers will merge in, where I can interface with language models across different providers. And it's not as easy as saying Android versus the iPhone, which are some people are saying, um, which is a kind of a good way to look at some of the proprietary large language models out there that are, have combined hardware with it, right? So in the old days, you had to ha have hardware bolted onto anything with AI. Okay, that's an old school technique. And people are doing that today in these foundational models where hardware and GPUs are bundled directly into the software that makes them the iPhone-like, very purpose-built. Question is, is that going to be coexisting with an open source framework where everything's open and you can decouple software from hardware? Well, we know decoupling hardware from software is a good thing, but maybe it's not. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Is, sometimes it isn't. I mean, that's you know, the question. Is there an Oracle iPhone? The data, right? I mean, that's in, in that world, it's a good yeah, thing to it's, have engineered systems. It's engineered, exactly. And that's, and, and, you know, you don't hear anyone talking about the iPhone and Apple having privacy problems. I mean, they got some of the best security on the planet. I love the yeah. biometric stuff, right? Yeah. And I don't have to worry about, you know, two-factor authentication too much with Apple. So Apple doesn't get a lot of, enough credit, in my opinion, for their their security days. So that's my take on the whole where well, Microsoft could go wrong. What about what about this other topic we sort of touched on about the, the Microsoft laying off its most of its ethics team? <laughs> you know, that is like saying, hey, if you're going to build a nuclear bomb, you don't want protesters in your fucking company. <laughs> I mean, look at Google, right? Is it, are they firing the hall monitors so they can get the job done in, in a very opaque, ethical manner? That's is what I'm it, saying. You know, Dave, this is going to be it. Like, it, is it a is it a page out of Facebook? Like profits before before ethics? But remember, I, remember, remember, Google had a big protest from their employees not to bid on government contracts where AI was involved. I right? do. So, uh, that, so uh, 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 let me let's take the activism. Take the activism employees, right? Let Maybe they're. You, who knows? Let me, let me take the other side of the argument. I actually think it. I can. I can make an argument that this makes sense for Microsoft because it's like having a separate customer success. I went. Neg team. I went negative on it right away. <laughs> like, sorry. Well, I, no, I, I sort of. I when I first saw it, I'm like, what? This is like, are you kidding me? But then I, I started thinking about it. Again, why would they do this? Like my example is, you know how uh, companies have a customer success team, which is yeah. like idiotic. The customer success has to be the responsibility of who who's ever delivering, not some separate group that you can say, oh, it's their yeah. point. So I think it's the same with AI ethics. It can't be a bolt on in somebody else's responsibility. Now, why would you do the layoff? Why wouldn't you, you integrate these folks into the product teams? So maybe you're right. Maybe. Well, no, I, that's, I was going to, I was just going to let you, I finished and I was going to get to that exact point. Let's look at ethics and AI together and to, and separate. AI has gone through the longest drought of momentum. You can go back, pick a year. I, I picked 1990, maybe 88, maybe 86. MIT, Northeastern, Carnegie Mellon, Berkeley, name all the top schools. 83. Okay, let's just pick <laughs> pick 1990. It's a better better year. Easier Fine. math. Easier math. Okay. Yep. 1990. And when would, when would you say that AI just kind of picked up? Was it, would you say 2006, 2020? Let's pick a year. 1990 to say 2020. I'd say 2015. Okay, there it is. That is a drought. The AI never stopped. So you had people working on it. There wasn't enough hardware. Now there's no cloud computing. Data had to be you know rule-based, natural language. Processing was like elementary. And AI never really had that moment where they could be enabled. And I think cloud computing did that. That's my take on it. Now, the ethics team here could have either been old school people acting like a policy team to advise and lobby government. We're good. We're we're not evil. We're big, we're big good Microsoft. You know, we're big, but we're we're good. Or AI wasn't ready. So my thinking is, and my reading this, and I think that we'll dig into it, Dave, with Microsoft is that they they got they actually have real ai things happening it's called chat gpt and bing and copilot so the ethics team if they're not working on products what good are they they don't need a policy team they need theory do they need to have people in a room for, uh, making up ethics theory or just go work on the products so um from what i've heard and the comment from microsoft is that they 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 said they're putting more energy in the product teams 
building services. Yeah. Right. So to me, what this probably happened was it was probably some policy team that would go to the big events and present conferences, papers, and talk about how clean and ethical Microsoft is, and they're taking an approach. And that the executive probably just said, hey, let's put all these, everyone into the product teams. Let's get the products better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's like security. It's got to be a fundamental component uh, from the, it's got to be built from the ground up. It can't be a an afterthought. And so, but but it's just still interesting to me that none of these folks, whether they were hall monitors or ethics experts or whatever, were it, it integrated back into the products team. They were just laid off. <laughs> my first like, my okay. my first negative story jumped in my head was okay. That's like you know you want to get away with murder. You know you don't want the police around. You know so yeah. you want to hi, hi, kill the hall monitors. You don't want any noise. You know so right. I think it's a focus issue. But that's where my head went. Like. Why would you kill an AI anything if AI is the next big thing? So that's the question that Microsoft probably doesn't want to address with PR because it's a public relations disaster for them. Yeah. If AI is so important, and we all know it's not yet like fully baked, it makes mistakes. Ethics is the number one thing that needs to, needs to be worked on. Why would you kill the team? Yeah. Yeah, that well, doesn't make any sense. It's it makes zero sense yeah, unless well, it was not just, unless it was a fake team. You just made sense of it. It's it, maybe it was the wrong skill sets for what they wanted to to do, and they they didn't need the friction. They needed the speed, and you know I <laughs> I got to tell they, you the Microsoft yeah. product teams are going berserk. Bing is better than it was. They got more traffic. I guarantee you Excel is going to be kick ass with this. You got, you can do some oh, yeah. macros. You can do words going to make right papers for you. Okay. Um, team Think PowerPoint. about Excel. Take Excel. I, I mean, I used to do use Excel every day, all day. I was one of the first people on the planet to, to trained in Lotus one, two, three slash file retrieve. I remember it. Well, I was a master. I go into Excel today. I'm like, wh where is that again? Everything's changed. I would just love to be able to interact with Excel with natural language, with the English language, and have it do yeah. what David Floyer can do. But and that is, would be amazing. How about an EBITDA target? Hey, give me an income statement with 67% uh, EBITDA. <laughs> Boom, there it is, Dave. There's your, there's your spreadsheet. What's my ACV have to be? And what's my region? <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, it's going to be amazing. When they, the, the, the ethics you know. conversation is simple here with AI. A lot of people are going to have their jobs go away, and that's a fact. I mean, look at ChatGPT4. They got tax code. You can write software, apps. I mean, it's going to accelerate all the software mechanisms. That's a word Andy Jassy used to wear all the time. There's mechanisms in place. People are going to be unleashed from the hassle of the blocking and tackling drudgery of their day jobs. And if AI can do things like do the heavy lifting on this stuff, it's going to open up creativity. Now, the short term is going to be a massive amount of shit hitting the market. Fake images. Everyone's going to be pumping out content. You're going to see the rise of content mills. That's going to be my prediction, Dave. You're going to see that come back. You know, the next listicles. Give me 10 top reasons why. Uh, you know, all this kind of content is going to come out out of nowhere. You're going to yeah. see really a surge of vanilla content. Experts yeah. are going to come out of nowhere. Fake everything is coming. So but a lot of know. legit, a lot of legit activity. Think about legals, paralegals. Think about what paralegals do. I mean, just do the same thing over and over and over. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, I've said before, within five years, virtually every job is going to be AI powered, with very few exceptions. Yeah, and the short term, but but the, what the what's going to do though is going to have two sought two impacts. Like you said, it's going to make people who are okay at something become better, and people who are good at something become great. On the other hand, you're going to have uh, the uh, the perverse reaction to that incentive is to be fake everything. I'm a fake writer. I'm a fake journalist. I'm a fake novelist, fake Excel spreadsheet, if they don't have the intellectual capital to do it. So to me, the, this is going to shift the narrative to reputation and intellectual capital. The reason why these mechanisms were existing was to serve a purpose, whether you're a PR firm or a law firm, there's a job to do. <laughs> and if that job is no longer needed, you're gone. So yeah. there are, you know, taxes will they'll still be, need a lot of jobs. It's going to shift. This is the yeah. same exact argument we dealt with 12 years ago, Dave. Remember, you know, bank tellers are going to go away from the ATM machine. Well, guess what? That never happened. So they actually increased in more tellers. So the, people will did lose they? their jobs. Did and, they? I don't know. I, I can't remember the last time I went into a bank. <laughs> <laughs> they're everywhere <laughs> maybe this maybe you it's a west coast thing the past and the future i like to say maybe maybe it's uh 
Yeah, but th- that was the argument that the ATM would kill the branch offices. Well, it wasn't the ATM. It was just online banking, yeah. right? I mean, I, my branch offices, especially that and COVID killed the branch office. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just plenty of branch yeah. offices. Wells Fargo has more branch offices than ever before. But I think the the, ne- the point the point is is that jobs are going to be lost, but gains are we made on the other side. So to me, I'm very bullish on the fact that the heavy lifting in jobs will be automated, and that's going to sharpen the focus of value. And that's going to be intellectual, proprietary knowledge, intellect. And I think AI scales intellect, Dave. And I think there's a there's an opposite side of it where it's dangerous, like the France images that were posted on Twitter. I just posted. But that's John, dangerous. But 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 it comes down to the topic we had on our first pod was was education. Like you had North Carolina saying we outlawing Chat GPT can't use it, and you had the Wharton professor who posted on Medium saying, I'm. I'm insisting that my students learn how to use uh, uh, generative models, generative AI, and and learn how to train it and progressively prompt it. You know, yeah. you, you use it all the time. So do I. You, you know what that means. And so you have to learn how to use these systems. And this is just the beginning. We're in inning yeah. one. And it have first half inning. Yeah. And I think that let's, you know, in, who makes money from all this, right? That's going to be the, that's going to be the new apps. Um, so it's going to be fun to see. I just think we're going to have this Cambrian explosion of, of, of um, creativity, but there's going to be a moment, Dave, that someone that's going to have consequences of, of important consequences that's going to make everyone go, wait a minute, hold on. That's the question on the table. I don't know what the answer is. Is it different opinions? Is it what is that? What is that plane on the Hudson moment that Twitter had? Remember, Twitter had that moment where everyone was taking pictures from their tweeting their themselves on the wing of the airplane on the Hudson River. Yes, I think it's going to be like a, a hundred thousand or millions of those moments that are aha moments. Andy Cunningham, you know, getting to aha. There's going to be aha moments throughout society that is going to be, create that Cambrian explosion. What do you think the first one is going to cause people to slow down, saying, "Wait a minute, AI is not as good as it promises." Election tampering. Uh, I, I was just going to say this the election. <laughs> you know, 20, 2016 was was ridiculous, and then twenty twenty, it was like, oh my god! I think twenty twenty four is going to be. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, Brendan, uh, producer, who Brendan, our producer, you know, was saying that it's going to be these memes. You know, you get the presidents playing Call of Duty together. Like, I mean, all these things are out there. You can fake anything. So I think you're going to have a lot of new and misinformation that's going to be disguised as content. And there's going to be a need for kind of a uh, approved arbiter, you know, uh, you know, who's going to determine what's real, truthful and reputable. So I think the machine arbiters are going to be slower than it's like hackers. The hackers are going to always outpace, you know, the defenders. And I think we're going to push AI to new limits before the machine can protect us from the machine. Well, I'm 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 hopeful that it's going to be an arms race of goodness in the cloud players. Microsoft's won nothing over the others right now with uh, their their big push, yeah. and and we'll see how Amazon responds with this. I think there's going to be a strong response from Google and AWS and others. I think you're going to see a major surge of of new new stuff. It's going to be again a Cambrian explosion. Um, getting back to the enterprise, Dave. Um, you know, where's the hot things? You know, I, I took notice of your breaking analysis last week that you dropped on Friday, Saturday morning. Um, it, got, it got washed out with all the um, SVB stuff. But you mentioned Databricks, right? You brought up yeah. this, you know, uh, cautionary kind of like question on data on Databricks. I know you got a story about Snowflake in the works and others, but you brought up this kind of approach where you you talked about this data centric tech stack with a semantic layer for transforming business, and you kind of called out Databricks. Are they in the right path? Kind of a question mark. It wasn't really a, a hit piece of any kind to Databricks. In fact, it was I thought it was kind of complimentary of Databricks. But you brought up this shift at George Gilbert, and you had a great riff, and that post was was long and detailed. What yeah. was your main takeaway? Was it automation is changing and multiple sources of data? Was it the shift to data-centric stacks? Is it the yeah, death so, of the old school BI and 
and data warehouse to the new AI ML cases? What was that? What was it all about? It's a, it's Take a us confluence, through. a confluence of a number of factors, several of which you mentioned. And by the way, it got great traction despite all the SVB noise. I mean, essentially, what you have is you're right. Databricks has been incredibly successful. I actually wrote about them again today. I showed some some data on some emerging companies, and they are just up and to the right. They got tremendous momentum. There's sort of similar spending momentum in the survey base as Snowflake, but their dominance has been on a AI tooling that has really been appealing to data scientists and data engineers. And we go back to GPT. A lot of these foundation models can essentially supplant or even replace what the Databricks value proposition is. And so there's some real concerns that we had and George collaborating with George is unbelievable to go so deep on this where we're shifting from a world that is sort of app centric to one that's that's data centric where the data previously is locked inside the apps and now today data is going to be sort of ubiquitous but the the, the elements of that data are going to be all yeah. coherent so the example is uber you got dr drivers you got riders you got maps locations ETAs, those are all different data products or data elements that are all coherent. And to make them coherent, you've got to have a system that has a semantic layer to connect all those dots. And so that's where DBT Labs comes in at scale, reached out to us and said, hey, Dave, you know, you know us, we're, we're part of this equation. We got a briefing with at scale coming up before we do the snowflake piece. So it's a highly, again, GPT, highly disruptive technology to many, many areas, and we focused in on this one. Yeah, I thought it was a great piece. I mean, my takeaway was um, it, that and when I kind of zoom out and kind of go board level kind of impact, it's just that the technology is continuing to evolve with cloud scale. Edge, we're seeing we, the super cloud vision that we've been talking about. The shift from application-centric siloed shit to data-centric stacks, you know, and shifting that to, to automating processes when you got AI around the corner. So, you know, as you know, companies have, have all these silos out there in the outskirts of their company, but who is put at the core? The Uber example to me highlights that that company puts data at the core of their, of their company and they exactly. embed logic in the data rather than the reverse. Right. So that was big thing. You know, is it, it's a data centric stack data is at the core embedding logic in the data versus the reverse and so that to me was the, the 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 high order bit for me the second thing that i liked about your post and i'd love to get your thoughts because you mentioned at scale was because they're pushing the semantic layer right so um yep. and that's something we've talked about way before that they even were around i think annotating data right with semantic layer kind of gets applications to a point where the data elements have common meaning and coherency right you mentioned yep. that so you know whoever unlocks this Okay, um, is going to un unlocks the data so they can do that. They're going to have an integrated data solution, right? And so this is the this is the this is the thing. Now the question I have is: when you add new layers to the stack, Dave, how do you support the current applications? How do you figure out what to buy, when to buy it? Is it throw away the old, bring in the new? So I buy the main premise. I like the annotating the data piece, unlocking it and annotating it, making it calm and coherent. But is adding a new new layer to the stack to support the applications? Does it present more challenges than today's I, tools? It's a or... great question, John. I think it's a great question. You take the two best examples, Databricks and Snowflake. They've each got their domains. I think they're both going to evolve and reinvent themselves and, and do be very, very successful. I think both companies, especially Snowflake's got, you know, they've got a, they're public, they've got a, a big lead in, in simplifying data warehouse, et cetera. But there's new technologies on the horizon that, that basically they bring the capabilities of a graph database and its expressiveness with the query capabilities of SQL. Today, graph databases, you got to go backwards to, to query them. And this gets down to completely new database architectures down to how you lay data out on the disk, how you lay it out in memory. It's not a cat. It can't, you can't just throw memory and cache at the problem. It's got to be yeah. a whole rethink. And that's going to be very small. Initially, people are going to ignore it. You know, be, be, you know use cases are going to be very narrow, but that could be a new capability that, 
we see in conjunction with all this foundation model stuff that's coming out. Yeah, I mean, I think you you I think your post was clever with the Uber example because everyone can relate to Uber. They've had, if you haven't used an Uber, people are probably live in the Stone Age, technically speaking. Yeah. So everyone knows what Uber does. They see the car moving, and they have all the addresses, and so it's it has everything built into it. it's a really integrated model. So I like that was very clever to use Uber and other uh, leading companies like AWS and, and Airbnb as what future data platforms look like. So if you if if you're watching this and listening to this pod, check out that breaking analysis on the Databricks um future data platform. And just kind real of, quick, yeah. I asked George Gilbert, I said, well, just it was a setup question, but doesn't this technology already exist? Doesn't Uber have it? He said, yeah, they had to develop it themselves with you know super engineers. The the opportunity is to for technology companies to build that horizontal layer. And that's Gold well, a lot of a lot of the stuff that Uber does and Lyft, by the way, is in open source. So CNCF cloud native stuff has it. So KubeCon's coming up in Europe, going to be there. Yep. Um, they're all there, but you got to build it together. But I think it's it's the future of the data platform. They they've actually built it. So you got to actually deploy it. And I think that's the the post that is that that's, that's readable is the future of the data platform. Because let's face it, we live in a world that's all about data, right? Yep. So if you if with so much being generated every second. You got to have a platform that can store it, manage it, analyze it. So that's not an easy answer in this world because, again, the technology is shifting. So if you want to know about the future of a data platform, read that post. It's a good open move to start having the conversation, Dave. And uh, I'm excited by this because, you know, the we've been talking about data platforms since Hadoop. So to me, it was like we're back at we're back on the data discussion in a really relevant way because it's not yep. just because it's it's all about in our life it's because there's some cool tech happening yeah, right absolutely. and and structural change I and mean, you guys lay out the three layers of the platform in the post but this is why it's so important does the new new the, does the ai which is based on data is it compatible with this stuff that's got to be answered see that's why i like it i think it's so important i think they go hand in hand and and you have the the tool chains today in, in in AI. You remember Hadoop? It got killed by complexity. Then Spark comes out to solve that complexity. It's still highly complex. Uh, and then add to that, a Floyer chimed in. You know, I miss him. But he's, he comes in every now and then. AI inferencing at the edge is going to create so much data at such high volumes. It's going to need new architectures to deal with this stuff. And okay. so. Very exciting. So I just did a little chat GPT-4 on your post and just got the following um, mega tweet. This is the tweet that it spun out. Tell me if this passes muster, Dave, that promotes your post. Get ready for the next era of data with these key players to watch. Hyperscalers like AWS Azure are taking their key value stores and adding a graph query engine for unified storage and graph database. DBT Labs and Snowflake are simplifying data lakes and management, but the wild card is rational.ai, rethinking database architectures with the ease of relational power of the graph. Oh. And, with the and with the semantic oh layer God. defining common semantics for data, the next era is closer than we think. Stay ahead of the game with these players to watch. Hashtag data, hashtag tech, <laughs> hashtag innovation. That's chat chat <laughs> CPT writes like it came out of the Ivy League and it just makes shit up. <laughs> does that encapsulate the story or no yeah yes and no i mean you know i didn't we didn't certainly didn't say <laughs> that those guys are working on that although maybe chat gpt is speculating so i suppose they probably are working on you know bringing graph database to their team value stores <laughs> it's chat it's, it's chat gpt uh, says the wild card is relational rational dot ai so this is the reasoning by the way, I just did an update on who was John Furrier on Chachi before. It said I worked for Computerland, Dave. You remember? Yeah. You know, remember Computerland? Yes. Did you ever work for Computerland? No, I never worked for Computerland. It's, <laughs> and it says I sold my company to Hewlett Packard in 2006. It went under. Oh God, it's hilarious. <laughs> It's uh, so good. <laughs> it gets it right. It gets it right, but it has the they're they're calling it hallucinations. This is a great word. This really sounds legit. But yeah. ChatGPT is not perfect, Dave. But this it, is got, core... it got some of it right. I mean, it, it got a get, lot of it right, it, but it just yeah. made crap up. Yeah. That's, you know, that's not true. And that's not true. But boy, that sounds good. It sounded like it's compelling. <laughs> but that's the point. This is going to be the surge of fake shit coming, Dave. There's going to have to be semantic translation inside the so-called new reasoning answers. 
So this is where AI is really, this is the dangerous game right now. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see. I think it's going to, it's going to have to go through some vetting. Someone's going to build a tool, either collective intelligence or crowdsourced um, are going to be vetting content. There'll be a, there'll be a new brand that'll emerge. Maybe it's the cube that can be the arbiter of truth. But like I said, it's pretty dangerous. This chat GPT. It's, it's so good. It's, it's also it's so good. Though. It's so <laughs> it's, and I love it. So I gotta tell you, I'm totally, let's, let's move on to the, the, the rant section. We went a little bit long on, on um, the SVB right. story. Um, there's a huge TikTok inspired or TikTok enabled movement where Silicon Valley and Washington lawmakers are mobilizing quietly for an anti-China tech industry uh, position. And they're using TikTok as the as the stalking horse here. So what's what that means is is that the TikTok being owned by the Chinese is is being used as the tip of the spear to create a um, an anti-China sentiment position. Dave on TikTok, the Politico breaking story is TikTok is paying a dozen of creators to visit DC. While the while the Wall Street Journal is reporting that a group of Silicon Valley executives, including Peter Thiel and Washington lawmakers, are quietly mobilizing. Um, at law, with lawmakers to ban China or have them, you know, um, anti-China position developing. Not just, it's not just TikTok. It's an alliance because we know in the tech industry, the networking guys have been stolen from. There's a lot, it's well known that the IP was been stolen um, in China from the U.S. companies because China does no R and D. They just they it's stolen. Um, Reminds me of that scene in Animal House. They can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our pledges. And, and that's kind of how the U.S. got its, you know, <laughs> its, its dominance is we stole a lot of IP, but it's a different world now. You know, we're in charge, so we, we don't like it when it happens to us. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see how that China relationship continues. Again, national security to to economic. It's it's a double-edged sword, the, the economic benefits. It's going to be interesting to see, Dave. Well, that's my rant. I think that's going to be um, interesting to watch. Um, I'm excited to see the U.S. stick up for itself and and call out bad behavior if it's happening. Just got to like watch it. Um, and, and other news, TikTok is, uh, uh, the DOJ is uh, uh, being reported by the New York Post, that the DOJ is probing TikTok over allegations of spying on U.S. tech journalists. Hmm. Okay. Well, well uh, who knows? Spy on me all they want. Got nothing to hide. Yeah. <laughs> Just watch our... Watch our videos. Watch, listen to the Cube Pod. <laughs> All right, Dave. Thinking. Well, John, happy great, Friday. Great Did a good run. Good run. Um, great session. Um, What's coming next. up here on the Cube? What do we got? We got uh, RSA coming up in April. That's going to be a great event. CubeCon Europe, which is uh, in Amsterdam, Obviously, April nineteenth yeah. to the twenty first. Dell Tech Quick World. World. Dell Tech um, World. Click World. We had a great Women in Data Science event last week and International Women's Day. Um, just it's just good content coming out of the cube. Discover again in, in June. We got Snowflake in June. We'll be busy. Yeah, be busy. Well, Dave, next week we'll we'll be catching all the stories. And if you're watching and listening to this podcast, let us know how we're doing, things we can do better, things we should change, what you like to see, um, topics, give us feedback. So we're all online. John Furrier, Dave Vellante, at Furrier on Twitter, D Vellante on Twitter. Hit us up, let us know what you think, and uh, comment, share, spread the word. Tell us uh, what you think episode uh, five coming up shortly next week.